chamber for a few hours to listen to a number of presentations and a panel discussion about uh, post-war abstraction in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And this is, of course, part of our M Plus Matters series, and us is, of course, M Plus itself. Uh, I often say that M Plus is probably it's not the largest, but one of the largest museum projects in the world. But it, uh, I think I can say definitely, it's one of the most ambitious or the most ambitious and complex in the world. And this complexity, of course, uh, quite regularly uh, really demands that we just don't rely on our own thinking and our own ideas, even though we have a rapidly growing number of experts on board in the curatorial team, but we also need to call about uh, call upon others and sort of widen the discussion and, and broaden the discussion. And this is what happens in M Plus Matters. This is the fifth time we have uh, a subject that we, we bring uh, experts from around the world to come here to talk and, and discuss with us first in a sort of smaller circle, and then we expand it into a wider circle to also share with interested individuals in Hong Kong. Um, so the other uh, subjects we've discussed, for example, the question of design and Asia and design in Asia, um, and how you collect it and how you define it. Both these terms, of course, design and Asia, are you can debate them and, and actually deconstruct these, these items in many different ways. We've uh, had another M plus matter about, about uh, the sort of relationship and the sort of dialogue and, and uh, between ink art and the sort of Chinese or Asian tradition, ink tradition and uh, literati tradition and contemporary art. We've had one about, uh, about uh, the museum boom in China and the museum projects and, and the meaning of that and the sort of character of that and its, its sort of various uh, aspects. Uh, in, in, in different ways. And then also the most recent one was about the uh, sort of fluidity in a sense between documentation, artworks, and, and how these borders between the things you call documents and the things you call artworks are of course getting more and more blurred. And especially if you are a museum of visual culture, not just an art museum, you have even more reasons to debate these, these boundaries or non-boundaries. And today we're looking at a very specific topic, which is about uh, the question of abstraction and, and from, an, especially in the East Asian perspective, and its relationship to the West also, where of course abstraction is in a way, historically in modernism, the main, seen as the main driver, the drive towards abstraction. And of course, you, one can definitely question that story, but you can also look at the sort of interplay between uh, Asian abstraction and Western abstraction. And I think that's what, what happened yesterday and uh, maybe will happen a little bit today as well. So with that, I think I'll handing over to Leslie to say a few more words about this particular session. And uh, again, I wish you all very welcome and hope you enjoyed this afternoon. Thank you. in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. An important area of discussion for our collection and further thinking on exhibition programs. As I share with you more about the framework of today's uh, session, I'll play in the background a selection of artworks in the abstraction category in our current collection. We're lucky that we possess a strong foundation of art from uh, Hong Kong and mainland China. You can see a selection of them in this slideshow and also on our website. It is far from complete, but as we go forward, we want to stretch our vision and increase our collection effort to the neighboring countries, as well as the Asian, and, uh, Asian diaspora. We want to think about how our current uh, collected works can be, can be in dialogue with abstract works in the neighboring countries, 
In this way, we can consider artworks from various perspectives, make comparisons across geography and time, to see parallels, connections, and uh, differences that may have, may have, uh, may, that one may have each other. Since 2012, as Lars had said, we have organized four M Plus Matters where we discuss various issues in contemporary art and museum collecting. For today's talk, we want to push back a few decades to mid 20th century and look at how artists dealt with the ideas of modern and in particular, the concept and practice of abstraction. What does abstraction mean in different locations to different people with different experiences? And as we talk about post-war, which war, or wars, matter to each place? The art scenes in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan in the mid-20th century have very intense or tense relationship with America and American art, as well as with each other. As trans transmission of information goes, meanings change with circumstances. And of course, ideas travel in various directions. This network of influences Came, to, came into the consciousness of artists, and it is what we hope that we can bring to you today. Our speakers will point to various debates and dilemmas in which artists engaged either about the art information that they received from foreign places, or about the materials and inspirations from traditional arts and philosophy. Artists in East Asia especially contemplated the tradition of ink and calligraphy and its relation to abstraction. Our symposium today will zoom in on this question and at the same time broaden our scope of ink art to other regions in East Asia and as a continued effort to build on our past M plus matters on ink art. M plus matters always have two components, one internal workshop, as Lars had alluded to earlier, and one public symposium. In our internal workshop yesterday, some terms and themes have appeared throughout. And I want to share them with you as they can be keywords for us to think about as we hear the presentations today. They include tradition and modern, essentialism and nationalism, materiality, representation, process, and of course, abstract and abstraction. Our discussion yesterday was just a very, very early beginning of a long process. And we know that some of these issues will take a very long time to be resolved, or maybe, maybe never be resolved. And we hope today's discussion with all of you will bring us more insights and perhaps homework to do for our future museum. Before we begin, uh, a few housekeeping things. Each speaker will have 20 minutes uh, to give us their uh, research and presentation. And afterward, we will have a moderated discussion a Q&A session for you to join in as well. And we will conclude the afternoon with a recep reception in the lobby. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, Katie Siegel. Um, Katie is professor of art history um, and chief curator at Hunter College, the Q uh, Q uh, City University of New York. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. in the 1930s and 40s through the immediate post-war years. 
1936, director Alfred Barr organized an important exhibition at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Cubism and Abstract Art, and you see an installation shot here. Barr pleaded that the Whitney had already exhibited American abstract art the previous year, so he would only show European art. Um, and in fact, it's really just that people thought European art was better at the time. Uh, the art historian and friend of many American artists, Meyer Shapiro, Columbia University, took the catalog as the point of departure for his own broad statement about abstraction called The Nature of Abstract Art. While he praised Barr, Shapiro also criticized the account of art as divorced from social contexts and instead driven by artists' reaction against the art of preceding generations. He objected to the view of art history as powered by what he called a kind of internal logic that was primarily formalist, in which one mode of art making generated the following. Not surprisingly, most artists also objected to Barr's version of history. It didn't match their, hist their experience of how art was made, and it generally downplayed the role of the individual artist. They also disagreed with his definition of abstraction, which was programmatic. Barnett Newman, the artist and a close friend of Shapiro's, made the strongest case against a progressive history of art. Rejecting a history of alternating styles resulting in the advancement of art and society, which he identified in philosophical terms as the Hegelian dialectic, Newman vehemently objected to the idea that a pure abstract art, like that of Pierre Mondrian, um, a geometric art re represented the peak and conclusion of artistic development, taking art as far as it could go. Like his friends and peers, and many European artists as well, Newman saw the geometric art that emerged from avant-garde such as constructivism, Bauhaus, and Gestalt as rooted in failed attempts at social rationalization, utopian theories that aspired to make a fair and efficient world but always ended in authoritarian rule. By the mid-1930s, the European avant-garde seemed clearly divided into two basic practices or fields of exploration, abstraction on the one hand and surrealism on the other. And this is a lasting historical perspective. It's, it's something that's said over and over and over again in catalogs. Um, and so the same year that Barr had his show of abstract art, he also mounted uh, its counterpart, its sort of opposite, fantastic art, Dada, and surrealism. Americans had followed surrealism, although less closely than abstraction, from afar or on trips they made to Paris, and surrealism had been shown occasionally in New York. In the 1940s, there were also there were all those who adhered strictly um, to one of the two European strains, following either a particular abstract model like Mondrian, and there were lots of copiers of Mondrian in, the, in New York, or more generally, trying to follow surrealist methods or adopting surrealist imagery. But most often, American artists were trying to do something different, making art that seemed to bring elements together of the two strains, abstraction and surrealism. One common merger could be seen in drawing that represented um, or resembled archaic symbols borrowed from Egyptian, Assyrian, and pre-Columbian artifacts, evident in the paintings of Pollock, Pollock, Gottlieb, and others during the late 1930s and into the 1940s. This practice mystified um, American art critics and curators. And here um, you see an example by Adolf Gottlieb called The Rape of Persephone from 1943 which particularly bothered the New York Times critic, um, Edward Jewell, who described his bewilderment before art that seemed opaque and mysterious, um, like this painting, which had a black central form that looked a little bit like a head in profile with scattered symbols painted on top of and actually scratched into the paint. Gottlieb and Rothko, with Newman's help, responded to Jewell in a letter that offered um, sort of mockery for Jewell's attempt to explain the work in easily digestible form, uh, eschewing specific interpretations and affirming their emphasis on universal meaning. Quote, we assert that the subject is crucial and only that subject matter is valid which is tragic and timeless. That is why we profess spiritual kinship with primitive and archaic art. This source turned away from surrealist Freudianism towards a more American source of profundity. In his introduction to an exhibition catalog for Betty Parsons' first show, um, and Betty Parsons is an important 
um, New York art dealer that, be that began in the 40s. The first exhibition was curated by Newman and was called Northwest Coast Indian Painting. Newman called this art abstract. This is the, the Northwest Coast Indian art. But what he meant by abstract was a sophisticated use of symbols as opposed to the literal-minded um, realism that American critics seem to demand of contemporary art, sort of paintings of cowboys and farmers and ordinary um, people. The symbols in, in this Indian art reach towards deeper metaphysical meanings, sometimes referencing specific myths or feelings, but more often um, a sort of a generalized human impulse or emotion. Many of the artists who would later become known as abstract expressionists in the 1950s spent their earlier experimental years working with imagery from nature and from non-Western and often pre-modern sources that were primarily inspired by nature. Newman himself, um, in an early work, um, but also Torres Garcia, the Central American artist, um, Rothko, um, this is William Baziotis, and others evoked beginnings, both genetic and prehistorical, ancient art, cave paintings, images of cells, and also imagery of sea, sky, and earth, and in the attempt to touch something fundamental about life. Here, the interest in biological science common to older European artists like Kandinsky and Clay was often joined by an American transcendentalist philosophy, the devotion to a metaphysical view of nature. These interests were shared by figures as diverse as the photographer Edward Weston, um, the artist Isamu Noguchi, Charles Seliger, and um, Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect. The organicist's strain in art, design, and architecture was often called biomorphic abstraction, indicating that it was neither realist in the sense of an appearance-based um, kind of painting, nor abstract in the geometric Mondrian kind of avant-garde style. These shapes recalled under, underwater imagery, um, fossils, and other natural forms, sometimes if, as if seen through a microscope, a wondrous hidden world evoked in paintings by um, Mark Rothko, and this is Slow Swirl at the Edge of the Sea, um, Theodorus Stamos, and Gorky, as well as many others. This kind of invisible, mysterious nature was like um, the Gottlieb example of archaic symbols, an abstraction that was not defined by opposition to representation. That is, abstraction is not the opposite of figuration. By the mid-1940s in the US, the various meldings of abstraction and surrealism had clearly su su surpassed either of the two individual practices themselves in popularity. The question was, what was this third way? In 1945, curator Harold Putzel organized an exhibition at his small gallery in New York to ask this very question. He called it a problem for critics, and the exhibition included American artists primarily, such as Pollock, Gorky, Hoffman, Rothko, um, Gottlieb, and others, including Charles Seliger, including people, and this is one of the important points, that are not so famous, you know, much less well known today because they didn't fit into a, the category of abstraction. Um, and he said, this is that what, what we see here is the real American painting beginning now, as opposed to derivative of Europe. That same year, another curator, David Porter, organized an exhibition at his gallery in Washington, D.C., called 1950, A Painting Prophecy. He's predicting five years into the future, proposing a phenomenon that was still more definitively American, um, although American at that point meant primarily immigrants and exiles from other countries. It's important to remember that. Positing a union of highly poetic and personal art with a kind of painting which has for many years been expressed by inventions in pure line, form, and color, Porter defined the union as a romantic response to difficult times, an individual, even spiritual expression that didn't fetishize formal invention. Critics were excited by pu but puzzled by this new school of painting. Unsure which artists belonged to it, even more than who, Critics struggled to name what exactly this art was. This not knowing, this uncertainty, itself became a sought-after condition, a positive condition <coughs> of process-based discovery, risk, and invention. This openness itself became a new <coughs> definition of abstraction. Abstraction was not knowing what the answers were ahead of time, um, one that continued into the 1940s and the 1950s. Um, one of the foremost 
abstract expressionist Hans Hoffman put it succinctly, <laughs> saying, quote, a picture should be made with feeling, not with knowing. Or, as artist Franz Klein declared of himself and his fellow artists, we don't begin with a definite sense of procedure. It's free association from the start to the finished state. And this was not a simplistic endorsement of just throwing paint around. As the artist pointed out on another occasion, the immediacy can be accomplished in a picture that's been worked on for a long time, just as well as if it's been done rapidly. That is, what Klein valued most was the feeling of immediacy um, and physicality in the painting. The artist did not reject conscious deliberation and aesthetic decisions in making a work, or so much as they rejected preconceived ideas. The emphasis on process, experience, feeling, life, as opposed to planning, sketching, finish, took the intellectual guise of rejecting theories of art um, by theoretically um, sort of uh, oriented critics and aestheticians. Um, speaking at an art conference sponsored by the American Society for Aesthetics, Newman declared, aesthetics is for me like ornithology must be for birds. And despite their appreciation of the support given, they were not eager to enroll themselves in the categories constructed for them by even sympathetic cri critics. In a private 1951 roundtable, the year 1951 was the year that financial success finally came to these artists after years of hardship. Um, Alfred Barr, again from MoMA, pressed the artists and asked, what is the most acceptable name for our direction or movement? It has been called abstract expressionist, abstract symbolist, intrasubjective, etc. David Smith, the sculptor, immediately replied, names are usually given to groups by people who don't understand them or don't like them. A lot of people think critics don't like artists very much. Um, Willem de Kooning ended the whole day, the whole procedure, by declaring, it is disastrous to name ourselves. That same year, and here's de Kooning um, working on one of his famous women paintings, that same year in a MoMA symposium called What Abstract Art Means to Me, he, de Kooning talked about the splitting of painting into two incommensurable halves as m modern painting became modernism, a dogma, or a theory. He said, the aesthetics of painting were always in a state of development parallel to the development of painting itself. They influenced each other and vice versa. But all of a sudden, in that famous turn of the century, a few people thought they could take the bull by the horns and invent an aesthetic beforehand. After immediately disagreeing with each other, they began to form all kinds of groups, each with the idea of freeing art, and each demanding that you should obey them. Most of these theories have finally dwindled away into politics." End quote. De Kooning pointed out that subject, content, representation, became defined as the negative of the critical prohib prohibition. The question, he said, as they saw it, was not so much what you could paint, but rather what you could not paint. You could not paint a house or a tree or even a mountain. It was then that subject matter came into existence as something you ought not to have, end quote. Like subject matter, this process created pure abstraction as this kind of separate category. De Kooning described abstraction as a kind of experience, a quality, not separate from representation, that was, was commonplace in all painting, all good painting, before plant painting was split into two positions, dogmatic positions, um, that labeled and defined and confined um, artists. He advocated for abstra abstraction not as a program, not even as the painterly materiality with which he was so involved, but as in de Kooning's words, quote, the nothing in a painting, the part that was not painted, but that was there because of the things in the picture which were painted, that nothing was always regarded as a particular something, and as something particular, the only thing that truly mattered, end quote. The situation that de Kooning described was very broadly the one in which all mid-century modern painters found themselves. It culminated in a post-war situation, and obviously post-war is as complicated a term as abstraction, but there's not time for that um, right now. Um, in, this, in this situation where not only were smaller labels, movement labels like cubism or surrealism, um, but representation and abstraction themselves narrowed and hardened as definitions, creating a polar situation between the two. 
After World War II, artists increasingly experienced the pressure to make that choice between abstraction and representation as not only an artistic pressure, but as an ideological pressure with capitalist democracy and communism both claiming the progressive position. There was abstraction in the West and realism in the East, as the German artist Baselitz later put it. In the late 1940s and 50s, in Darmstadt, Germany, in London, and in New York, there were conferences and publications and exhibitions dedicated to this debate, where the artists talked about the face of man today and the freedom of the artist in the wake of World War II, discussions that broke down the possibility into either abstraction or representation. But there was another way, at least one other way, of locating artistic possibilities in this context, one that already in the 1940s refused the mainstream non-choice between abstraction and representation. Some artists, many of the artists um, that we love the most um, in, in this historical period, including de Kooning, the German artist Valls, um, Jean Dubuffet, and Francis Bacon refused this split of modern art into two poison choices produced by a poison society. All of them refused ideology and politics. Even the most apparently abstract artists, such as Rothko and Mark Toby, objected to the term abstraction for its connotations of subjectlessness, for the way it seemed to deny the validity of things that were not for visually perceivable, including feeling, spirit, and sensation. And this is a Mark Toby um, title, The Edge of August. Toby described his attempt in this painting to grasp the edge of summer's shading into fall, saying, the edge of August is bringing the intangible into the tangible. In that sense, it's the opposite of abstraction, though the means may appear abstract. <laughs> um, this accounting that I've very broadly sketched today um, outlines some of the ways in which artists refuse labels and at the same time are very specific about what they do. It's the labels that are general and, and it's the paintings that are specific. From this perspective, exciting work remains to be done on mid 20th century art, work that promises to create as well a fertile ground for thinking about contemporary art. <laughs>